My name is Golan Levin. I'm a professor of art uh, and uh, also director of the facility you're in, which is the Frank Ratchie Studio for Creative Inquiry. This is the research laboratory of our College of Fine Arts here at Carnegie Mellon, uh, where we are a center for supporting uh, the intersection of arts, science, technology, and culture um, through atypical and antidisciplinary research and outreach. <clears throat> Um, tonight, uh, to introduce our guests, uh, we are really thrilled uh, for this Steiner Lecture Series in Creative Inquiry uh, to partner with the School of Music uh, for our guests this evening. And to introduce our guests is my co-host, uh, Professor Alexa Woloshin. Thank you. Hello, everybody. I'm Dr. Alexa Woloshin. Some of you may know, some of you don't. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome you here. Uh, David Grimes, David Yeager, Larry Lake, and uh, Jim Montgomery did not know one another before arriving at the University of Toronto. Yet, like many graduate cohorts, they bonded quickly. Late night sessions in the University of Toronto Electronic Music Studio sealed their lifelong friendship and creative collaboration. The first concert under the title Canadian Electronic Ensemble was in 1972. Since that time, the Canadian Electronic Ensemble, or C has experimented, composed, performed, toured, record, and commissioned electronic music. The CE's personnel has transformed over its nearly five decades, but the core of its practice and mission has remained. As the CE approaches its 50th anniversary, the members reflect upon decades of live electronic music making and articulate their hopes for the CE's electronic music future. This is primarily going to be um, just a discussion moderated by me, and then there'll be a time for questions in a little bit. So why don't we start first by um, each of you in turn um, introducing yourself briefly uh, and saying how you became involved with the Electronic Music Ensemble. And if you're a founding member, what do you recall about that early uh, formation? Sure. All right, well, having been handed a mic, I guess I'm first. Uh, I'm David Yeager. I'm one of two of the founding members who are in the, the current group. Um, and what Alexa has said in her introduction is absolutely true. I've never met these, these uh, people before. Uh, <laughs> the uh, University of Toronto in 1970 uh, still cl clung clung to a, its reputation as the second electronic music uh, studio founded in North America after Columbia Princeton. And it was largely because of, of that reputation that I was drawn to U of T to do my, my graduate study. Um, and so Jim and Larry and David and I would uh, uh, hang out together and Eventually, you know, there were no commercial instruments at the time. Am I going on too long? You wanted shorter <laughs> introductory statements? <laughs> forgive me, <laughs> forgive me. I'll, we can come to this point sooner, uh, soon enough. All right, so I'll come to what have I, what was the question? What have I noticed? Do you remember, what do you remember about the formation? Oh, of see, that's my memory is <laughs> hanging out with these guys and, and, you know, just deciding, well, we can play this gear. It was all this rack mounted gear. So we did, and we thought, well, let's let's pull it out of the rack and take it on stage. And let's create work, and, and we basically had to <clears throat> come up with a new compositional language for this new experience. So, Paul. Hi, <clears throat> I'm Paul Stillwell. Uh, I had to think back a little bit for uh, for how I joined the ensemble. Uh oh, closer. Um, and, um, yeah, I got two of them here. Oh, that's what it is. Yeah. <laughs> okay, you know what? Take this one back. I'll just use this one. That solves that problem. Okay, so uh, I came to the ensemble um, at a time when I had actually quit doing music. Um, I, it was a period of about seven years. Uh, when I was in college, uh, and it was a community college, not a university like this, um, I became so disenchanted um, with the way things worked there um, that I left, uh, I dropped out and I left. 
and I had such a bad taste in my mouth from that. It actually prevented me from touching any instruments for a period of about seven years. I had the opportunity to uh, acquire some gear, um, computer gear, uh, and along with that I had decided that I was going to start working on electronic music. Uh, my background previously had been in jazz trumpet. Um, and so I put a system together, uh, I started making some music with it. It was all done via MIDI, we had no, no ability to do audio recording onto a hard drive at that point. And I started posting these MIDI files on a service called CompuServe. Uh, this is pre-internet. Um, and Larry Lake uh, heard some of my compositions, reached out to me, uh, invited me to, uh, to come and hear the ensemble, and then commissioned me to write some music for the ensemble. And uh, I never left. I just, I just stayed. Um, and that's, that's kind of my story about, about joining the ensemble. Uh, I'm Jim Montgomery. I'm another one of the found founders. Uh, my background was in uh, completely in classical music. Uh, in fact, I had never, uh, I knew nothing about electronic music when I got to the U, U of T. I didn't even know they had a studio. Uh, I went to the U of T to, to study composition. Um, so my first introduction was uh, a seminar that was conducted by Gustav Chilimaga at, in u -Tems. And it was a relevatory ex experience. It's, all of this stuff is completely new to me. In fact, one of my uh, more embarrassing uh, memories is holding forth in the, in the seminar about how this wasn't really music. This was sound sculpture. And uh, cl clearly it, it operated under different laws and different uh, uh, parameters than uh, real music. So that, that attitude uh, was beaten out of me in about uh, three weeks. <laughs> and once I uh, became acquainted with the, the other three guys, um, it's been all downhill from there. So uh, that was my introduction to the CEE. There's another mic right there. I studied, um, I'm from Toronto, and I studied um, in music at the University of Western Ontario, which is in London, Ontario, um, southwestern Ontario. And uh, I, I saw that um, there was a course called Electronic Music, and I was really excited about it, and I took it. Um, and that changed my life. Um, so I, I would spend all my time, or as much time as I could, going to the library and uh, looking, hunting up records and CDs of electronic music it was so exciting. Um, and discovered the CEE -E records um, and listened to them. And it was really exciting exploring electronic and unusual music. And when I came to Toronto back home after finishing, I found out that the music gallery direct of where which Jim was the artistic director was. There was a job. Um, it was more about like carting boxes and heavy equipment, so I wasn't exactly the one, probably the one for the job, but that's how I met Jim. And I had a feeling he was in the electronic ensemble. I was like, is he at the electronic ensemble? Like, this is in the interview, and, and so I said, I love electronic music. Uh, but one of the ensembles I really like is the Canadian electronic ensemble. He confirmed that he was in it. And somehow out of that came various things, like I did a concert at the music gallery, and then the, the ensemble commissioned me to write a piece for the ensemble for one of the concerts, and eventually I just sort of morphed into being a member. So that's my story. Um, hi, I'm John Camille Farrar. Uh, I'm a pianist and composer and uh, visual artist. And uh, I studied also well, in University of Toronto um, composition. And then I started, uh, after I graduated, I was kind of lost and wandering and uh, kind of started slowly mixing together my 
lives in improvisation, experimental music, and uh, classical music, and electronic music. I kind of mix them all together when I play, and then sometimes, yeah, I guess I, as a student I needed a summer, summer job, and uh, my <clears throat> dad got me a, a job, a summer job in a factory um, cutting cellophane, these like incredibly razor sharp knives. And on the very first day of the job, I, I sliced my thumb open, so I, I quit the job and uh, immediately, because I was in the, the, ho the hospital room with another guy, and the guy said, you're a pianist? What the hell are you doing here? You're going to lose your hands in, in a few days. So I quit the job, and I, I had like um, 10 days left before my dad got back from vacation to get another job. So I, uh, <clears throat> there's, a, there's a point to this story. I went through the um, yellow pages, and I was like, looking at music, music, desperately looking at music. I loved like experimental music, <clears throat> and then uh, this like music gallery came up. I was like, what the hell is the music gallery? And then I called them up, and it was like a center for experimental music. And uh, <clears throat> Jim was the guy that answered the phone. And um, then I got a, it's an amazing coincidence, like the same as Rose. I got a summer job at the music gallery, um, getting coffee for the sound engineer. My official title was uh, assistant sound engineer. I was really like assistant sound engineer, coffee sound engineer, coffee, coffee holder, you know, yeah. And um, but I just learned a lot, and then I just that's how I met everybody. And then later on, when I kind of had my own life, they invited me to jam with them, and then I became the new guy in the band. It was my turn to be turn to be new guy in the band for a few years before. Hello, my name is David Sutherland, and I am the new guy in the band. Uh, how I got here? Well, if we jump back very quickly. In the 70s, I got involved in electronic music in Montreal. I was with a song called Meta Music, and we did live improvised music. Pretty much the same deal as the CEE, uh, basically taking the studio apart, moving it into a concert hall, and playing around with it. I knew about the CEE. They were the cool guys. They didn't know about me. I was a nobody. And then I moved to Toronto, and they were there. And I was like, oh, these guys won't even talk to me. So I got into computers, and then I got out of computers because I got old and retired. And I started, since all this modular synthesizer stuff. So I got into that, and just hanging around, met Paul still over there. And he invited me over to his place to jam, and we jammed. And it was good. It was like insane because it was like I hadn't done that kind of music in close to 40 years, maybe 45 years. And it was just like it all came back, like riding a bicycle. It was easy. Just the best thing I'd ever experienced in my life. Just And so we did a couple more things. And then Paul, maybe Paul wants to say how he actually introduced me or something like that. Because I got invited to play a gig and then they said, you're in the band. It was basically like an audition, and uh, I was in the band, that's it. What were you? So, obviously, there's the set members of the CE, but you've also collaborated with a lot of musicians. Um, and what have you found have been sort of maybe the common um, characteristics of, of a successful collaboration? And do you have any dream collaborations moving forward? So uh, being here in, in Pittsburgh has uh, actually given us, and, and Alexa, because she, she's forcing us to do this, um, uh, you know, has uh, given us the opportunity to uh, reflect a lot uh, about the history and some of the concerts that we've been involved in. Um, and for us, it's, it's, a, it's kind of a vibe thing. Um, it's, uh, as Dave describe it, describes it, it's almost like uh, another level of communication that happens uh, between us, uh, a collective consciousness, if you will. Um, and when we can work with somebody who can tap into that with us, then it's good. Um, you know, we've had the opportunity this week to work with the Exploded Ensemble, and that has been insanely good. Um, and actually, uh, it, it was quite I think we were all very pleasantly surprised at how that had all unfolded. Um, and 
if you can make it out to the concert tonight, you really should because it will be something. Tomorrow night. Tomorrow night. That's what I said tomorrow night. Tomorrow night. Is it tonight? I'm sorry. It's tomorrow night. I'm confused. Life up. Um, but thinking back to another collaboration that we did that was that was really special for me, um, it was not actually a musical collaboration. I mean, we did music, but we worked with a dancer from Montreal by the name of Lena Cruz. And if you ever get the opportunity to find some videos of her and, and see her work, she truly is amazing. Um, she had never improvised before, and we had uh, basically a week-long residency with her at the music gallery, thanks in large part to Jim. Uh, and um, she came in, she had this set choreography, and, um, and so we worked with her the f in the first rehearsal, and she did this set choreography. And then every time we did this throughout the week, um, during, in, and this is during performances, um, she would let go a little bit more and a little bit more. And finally, in the, f in the final show that we did, she let go completely, and everything was just on fire, and that was really a, a truly wonderful collaboration. Um, all the lines of communication were open. Uh, the communications visually from Lena with us, her responding to what we did, us responding to what she did, um, all of that kind of stuff happened, and uh, that made for a really wonderful collaboration. One of the one of the areas that I would I'm, I'm interested in pursuing is uh, we've had a very uh, mixed relationship with the uh, visual aspect of our concerts. Right? As you can probably see on the slides, that's basically what it looks like when we play. Right? When the instruments have changed and stuff, but it's not uh, what you would call vis visually compelling. So John uh, is a is a very fine artist and has been producing uh, some videos that we've experimented with uh, playing with and using as inspiration. And I really think that that's an area uh, that we could very fruitfully uh, develop. Uh, and uh, there are a whole bunch of uh, really interesting video artists out there uh, that we might uh, pursue some collaborations with. Any other dreams from that side of the room? Well, actually, I, I wonder if I could just take your mind further and ask John. We just, this afternoon, were through an incredible experience where your images were pro processed. Maybe you should speak to what was accomplished in that, in that exercise, because it, it could be a game changer for us. Um, so I guess a tiny bit of background is um, I mostly make these uh, pointillistic ink drawings. They're usually very small. They can take me a day, sometimes months, maybe even years sometimes. And then a couple of times I made um, stop animations, is that the word for it? Yeah. Time lapse, taking a, one picture or a few pictures a day of the progression of a drawing and then I made a five minute video, a couple of five minute videos um, of my drawings just so that I could actually interact with them while I'm performing solo. And then when we were going to do this, I thought, oh, why don't I um, send a couple of uh, QuickTime videos? And then we, we were going to do it today, and then it turned out that one of the people in the Explode Ensemble, her name is Gina? Gina. Oh, she's incredibly brilliant. She seems like one of these polymaths that does physics and computer music and also does visual art. I was just blown away. And she took my video and played it. I mean, she said to press play. But then she put it on loop. So after we got my original video for everybody to interact with, uh, it kept on looping. And she kept on like morphing it in the most incredible ways. So for me, it was like double gratifying to have everybody making music to my artwork. But then to see another artist twisting my artwork in all kinds of really weird ways and it was barely recognizable. So I was like, oh, it just it blew my mind open. So I was very happy about that. I was thinking I would love to just make more of those types of things, <clears throat> although I couldn't do what Gina did, but I could do what I can do and, and for us to work with in the future if we ever 
feel like? If you had asked that question a week ago, you would have had a very different answer. Um, you know, I might have said, well, God, I'd really love to play with you, Joan, for example. <laughs> but in three days in Pittsburgh, meeting this ensemble under its tutelage from Jesse Stiles, I mean, this would be my dream, actually. Uh, this is what I would say if I, if I knew then what I know now about the abilities and the, the wide-ranging interests, the sensitivities, the consciousness of, of these brilliant students here. I mean, we, we just kind of, it was like instant affinity. And, and uh, so this has turned out to be a, a great surprise, a wonderful surprise. Uh, I said after we finished rehearsing the first day, I said, we're ready to go on tour. We got to go on tour. It was that good. And um, so that's my answer today. <laughs> okay, great. Well, sounds like now you need to, after you've come down from this, I need to brainstorm some new dreams. Yeah, that's great. Um, I do want to tackle um, a topic head on. And so this is going to be a question for Rose. So um, it's probably apparent to everyone that Rose is the only woman in this ensemble. Um, Rose, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how you've navigated being a woman in the electronic music scene. And do you have any, um, any advice or strategies that, that have helped you find a, a place for your creative work? Yeah, OK. Can you grab a mic, please? Um, so, uh, yeah, that's a, uh, as the only woman in the band, I, when I joined the band right at the beginning of my career, as I was saying, so I was in my mid-twenties or so when, I, when it started, and just out of undergraduate university and trying to see what could happen with my aspirations as a composer, uh, and also as a, a, a violinist who wasn't all that interested, but it kind of anyway. This is this is the backstory. Um, interested in exploring new ways to play the violin other than say the traditional classical <coughs> repertoire, and uh, so I joined the CEE and I was the only woman in the band. Although there was for a while there was another violinist and so we became pretty good friends. She was a, also a woman, um, and then she moved to Florida, but. Uh, it's funny because the CEE are like they were like mentors to me. They're you know different generation, and I think the combination of a different generation of all guys. Um, I mean, Paul is not a different generation, more or less. Would you say? Um, but the, the three founding uh, members of the band uh, were a generation older, and then Paul was older, and so they were sort of mentors to me, and they. You know, taught me music, technology, all sorts of things, and so when you get the co combination of uh, um, that generational difference, then I didn't particularly find it unusual that I would be seeking advice from them, and that they would have a more like a come from a more knowledgeable place. Uh, later on in my career, I was when I started to wonder if things were not quite progressing as hoped for, but but maybe that had something to do with what other I've heard other uh, women and people complaining about when they face barriers due to things like who they are, and in my case, it's gender. Um, so, and this started to become more apparent, and it was just little things that started to build up and. And so, as a, you know, one day I, I found some disturbing, but not particularly alarming things happen where um, people with some really amazing women artists were being written out of articles of, about the, you know, Toronto's prominent composers, and and I, it was very upsetting. And so I formed uh, workshops for women in electronic music. Oh, sorry, I'm missing one step to this thing. Um, when I was in my mid-30s I went to a workshop and in that case I was surrounded by um, I was the only woman again 
but this time the guys were of my age, and some, a couple were a bit older, a lot of them were younger, but in general I was of the same age as them, and, and this became different, because then uh, all of a sudden there was a sort of layer of complexity. I definitely got along with them, but there was always a, a layer of complexity that I felt was always sort of hovering when I, when I needed assistance in technology. I felt like if I, it was complicated and, and more was at stake if I, I needed assistance and people were happy to help me, but I felt like I had to be calculated in asking for help and it was even more compu complicated if I wanted to offer help. That actually wasn't even an option um, for reasons that I, ha I think had something to do with me being the only female of, of about 18 guys. So, and, I, and if everybody was friendly, but I just had these uh, sort of feelings that I, if I tried to tell somebody something, was I the person they would want to hear it from? Mm. So that put me in this position I thought was, maybe that it wasn't the greatest. Well, why, why don't I have the option of, you know, sharing a cable and saying, no, this is the right one, not that one, and then they help me. And I, so I created a workshop for women in electronic music where we could help each other and not worry, and then ask silly questions and like, what, what, I don't understand this, why this isn't working, and not worry that it had anything to do with us. We, 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 we didn't, so we wouldn't feel like we were becoming an example of a stereotype we were trying to break down. And, that, and so we've done three years of that workshop, then a, bit of, a couple of years off, because things got very busy, and then I'll start up again. Um, and so when I started these workshops, I started to hear from the people who participated in the workshops and, and their stories were actually much more uh, problematic, I, I would <coughs> say, than, than my, my stories were. And, and, but we've, the idea was community building and making music together. So coming back to the CEE, that I realized that I'd somehow been exempt from what some of my female participants in these workshops have been like a lot of, a typical scenario was that they're the only girl in a band and the guys were of their age. And they, and somehow, um, not everybody had this, but there were some artists who, who actually either chose not to talk about it or didn't have any issues with it. Some people, like one woman I know who had, who went by a neutral sounding stage name, um, felt that in her online presence didn't, it had, didn't have anything to do with you know, gender. Um, but for, the, for a lot of the part, you had this scenario of being the only female in the band. And so, and the CEE was a weird band. And so it was, it was just a bit different. So um, um, so obviously, I mean, you're, there's six of you right now. Um, you all seem pretty happy with each other, so that's good. Um, but you always seem to be embracing new people, and I'd love to hear from the, the most recent, the new guy, David Sutherland. You know, what, um, what do you think is coming next with the CEE sound? I mean, you're the one who, who comes with the freshest ears. Where do you think the CEE is going? Well, there's, I'm going to divide the CEE into two bits. One bit is the CEE that comes out of the academic composer community, where they would bring guest artists and they would do, you know, regular academic comp composition with scores, maybe graphical scores, maybe actual common Western music notation scores. But the other piece of it is the just improvisation and it's entirely possible I guess one of the problems with getting into the classical traditional composer thing is is that's an all that's an entirely grant based business so until you get connections with someone who actually wants to give you the money to commission someone to do something and do this that that is kind of in my opinion uh, something that it's, it's it's sort of like being an actor you know, how do actors get cast? They audition. They don't make any, they don't have any control over that. And at some level, 
I don't think we have a lot of control over whether we're going to get commissions. We could try to be attractive, I suppose, but it becomes harder the older you get. Uh, but the other piece, and actually the piece that I think is more interesting for me, is the improvisation part. And so what does progress look like on the information, uh, on the improvisation side? And I'm going to suggest it's a little bit more like progress in a martial art, or the, where you know, you're not doing more and more, you're going deeper and deeper into it. And I think based on our experiences with the Exploder Ensemble, that was just an experience of going deeper and deeper really quickly with a lot more people. If I had my brothers, I'd do that a lot more often. That's my answer. Okay. Anyone else have, uh, have a thought about where the CEE is going? We've already heard that when there might be some more visual components. What about sonically or anything? Well, uh, I mean, we were talking about meeting issues head on. Uh, I'm not going to be doing this much longer. I mean, this is, <laughs> I'm 77 years old, right? I mean, how much longer can I actually do this? So, in my concept, my concern about, uh, in fact, it's not really even a concern. Uh, I'm not, uh, uh, I'm very confident that whatever it is, even whether it's called the Canadian Electronic Ensemble or not, whatever it is, what we're making, the way we, the way we do music, the way we involve ourselves with people, people we come in contact with, all of that's very positive. The the relationship that's that's, that's already developed very. Briefly, which uh, in a very brief period between us and the Exploded Ensemble, for instance, uh, is is not atypical. Uh, our um, collaborations and our work with uh, other artists, almost uniformly throughout our history, has had that kind of openness and um, immediate connection. You know. Uh, and I'm uh, convinced that that will continue uh, in the hands of these people. Uh, at <laughs> when I finally get too old to do this, right? And I think Rose, you had a oh well, it was just an idea. You, um, and it's not too much different than what we already do. But I was more thinking of uh, because when we perform, it's very traditional in a concert that you, or a more like an indie concert venue, like like the music gallery, some of the locations where it's more like an indie music space. Um, what would be more really wonderful would be a very high ceilinged or art space, just a giant space, with a big high ceiling where the speakers surrounded the space would have to figure out how not to get too much feedback, but we had a really good sound engineer that really was a master, and we had we sort of occupied the space. I mean, we wouldn't be the first, I guess I'm thinking of some other artists who have done this, and, were, and then we have lighting and video, and it would just be this wonderful happening where people would wander around, maybe there'd be like sofas and things. Like throw themselves out on the sofa, zone out, and that could be you know, a real event. Can I add something? Can you just talk about This is just a personal fantasy of mine. Um, who here knows Alan Watts? Okay, so correct me if I get stuff wrong, but if we sort of, the human potentials movement really had its establishment in so San Francisco, it, it was just a real center of that in the late 60s, the like early 60s. And Alan Watts was a British philosopher, mystic, and he hung around there. And there were all sorts of talks, it was LSD, it was the whole thing was going on. I've just had a fantasy of, rec and, and he lived on a ferry boat, 
And the ferry boat was just, you know, it didn't go anywhere. It was dangerous to run, but it was just on the dock. And you have all these incredibly interesting people meet in this ferry boat. And I've often thought that would be an incredible project installation to recreate the Valero. And I think it would just be incredibly cool for this band to be doing music for that project. That's maybe never happened, but if you, somebody else wants to do this, go for it. It's going to be amazing. Okay, let's get to work. Let's start planning these things. Um, I think I'm going to close down the formal discussion at this point. I'm going to um, play a little bit of a recent um, improvisation that the group was doing in Toronto in preparation for their visit here. And so during that, you know, one or two minutes, think about what questions you would like to ask them. stuff that's like you know especially since you're working in improvised ways that's uh, also coming out of prog rock or coming out of um, jazz right like there's, there's, tr there's traditions in terms of what's influencing you here that is not necessarily scored academic uh, composition in a really traditional sense and I guess I, I'm just curious about your relationships to other strains in electronic music that's kind of my question uh, and you know surely at some point you must have made like you know, how did you feel about Tangerine Dream in 1982? Were you thinking like, oh, that's not, that's not real electronic music. Those guys are, are like sellouts. Or, or are you thinking like, oh, they're popularizing this in an interesting way. Or, you know, like, curious about your relationship to these kinds of people. Because visually, they look just like you do on stage. They got a huge tower of shit full of, you know, like all these, like, you know, a huge amount of stuff they have to schlep out there. And, and you know, but they're making, they're making different kinds of music. Just that's my, like, the relationship to the other strains of electronic music. So that, the reason I grabbed the microphone is because Tangerine Dream is one of the reasons I got into doing electronic music. Um, so I'm a huge fan. Uh, also Depeche Mode, Kraftwerk, you know, all, all of that stuff. Uh, I really love it. Um, even, even into the more progressive rock stuff like Yes and Rush and, um, you know, anybody who uses synthesizers. I was just completely enamored with that kind of music. Um, 
the a lot of people uh, who were fans of Tame Dream Dream um, started to lose interest at least by the mid '80s um, because the the style of music had, had changed. Um, there was not as much improvisation in their in their studio work or in their live shows as there uh, as there once was. Um, I consider myself pretty fortunate to have seen them uh, two, two or three times. Um, it's hard to remember for <laughs> various reasons. Um, but um, you know, the last time I saw them, it it really it, it wasn't the same thing, uh, and and it was not something that uh, I was all that interested in anymore. Um, but certainly those instruments uh, that, that they used and, um, and the sounds that they created, particularly in the early days, um, those, were, those were way out there and, and very similar to the kinds of things that we do. In fact, when people say to me, you know, okay, you're in the Canadian Electronic Ensemble, what does that sound like? You're doing electronic music, is that like craft work? Is it like, um, is it like the Nashmo? Is it like um, all, all these other things? And I'm like, well, no, you have to go back a little bit further and go into the early days of Tame Dream Dream, uh, when there was a lot more improvisation and it was a lot more spacey. But, but Tandre, my, my question is not just about Tame Dream Dream specifically, but also, about the relationship to more academic electronic musics. I mean, there's so many strains, right? There's also like the film yeah. musics and things like that. But because yeah. because I think I, I would guess the Tantric Dream was not considered, um, you know, real music necessarily by the Academy also in, in the 70s. And there were plenty of, you know, schools with electronic music programs that might not have considered that to be legit. Right. Yeah, I didn't come from that space, yeah. so I'm going to hand the microphone to somebody who did. <laughs> <laughs> I think one of the great attractions to the medium of, of electronic music, and certainly live electronic music, is that it is wide open. And you can go anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, and, well, well the, okay, so save that point, Jim. Uh, <laughs> I mean, my personal interest uh, in electronic music and in contemporary composition in general is the development of musical language. and. I'm interested in finding ways and, and finding people, artists, who have the ability to transform the language of music. And so this was the thing that first got me into electronic music. And I discovered in other forms of music uh, that this was happening as well. And I think when, you, when you're talking about the, the popularization of electronic music, I mean, maybe they're not exactly bringing as much to the language of music that that is innovative, but it's still part of it. It's still very much a part of it. And I, I dare say I can speak to our departed colleague Larry Lake, who was a huge fan of, of all of these manifestations uh, of the art form. So I, I think the openness is, is uh, you know, and coming here and, and, and sitting down with with. Uh, these, these brilliant young people. We, we did a uh, project some, some many years ago where we put together a band of 18 players. We called it Mega Jam. We played twice with that big band uh, for an hour. And it was incredible. It was so thick, you could slice it. Uh, it was wonderful. But coming here and, and having this experience, uh, suddenly it's like we're back at Mega Jam, but now we have the ability to do something with it. It's just like a kind of work on the ingredients and work on the way the language is and how, it, how it's all shared between the participants. And that's the thing that really has, for me, the appeal. Well, there's a difference between being a fan and, and wanting to do it. I'm, I'm a huge fan of country music. <laughs> but I'm not, I'm not going to get to have the boots and, and uh, the guitar. Uh, in fact, one of the original uh, founding members uh, left, essentially, uh, because there was a disagreement about the direction that the, the, that the group was going to go. Uh, and um, the, uh, his interest was to move it in a, in a, I don't even, I'm a little uncomfortable even using the term commercial because it really wasn't an issue of money, uh, but it was 
make that more mainstream so that the uh, perceived audience would be bigger. Right. Um, <laughs> can I tell the story of uh, Synthescope? Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, we, in the, in the switched on Bach days, we did an album with the Elmer Iser singers of uh, Excerpts of the Messiah. And uh, we, were, we were really happy about this because we got paid really well. But we were really nervous about people finding out it was us. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we created another band called Synthoscope. And uh, so it was the Synthoscope Ensemble and the Elmer Iser singers who produced that album. So it, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's something that's thought about a lot. Right? Is that, is that yeah. getting at what you run? Yeah, it's good. Yeah. Can pass this, Alexa, you want to? You can find the Electronic Messiah album on YouTube. <laughs> it's on, it's on it's off right now. It's right there. Who's next? Oh, I got more questions if, if someone does. I don't, have, I don't have a plague of asthma, so I'm not going to infect anybody. Um, one of the things I've discovered over the past few years as somebody who's listened to electronic music since I was a little kid, my mom got me the, uh, a Kraftwerk album for my 10th birthday, and I drove my father insane playing the Audubon over and over and over again um, until he took it away. Um, in the past few years, I've been going to Moogfest, and that's where I've seen a lot of live performance of music, and it caught, kind of caught me off guard. They've canceled this year uh, for unknown reasons, but I was wondering, who do you see as either venues for finding new analog and experimental music or bands that are performing? I'm thinking um, Survive, they do the soundtrack for Stranger Things. We're just a couple of guys in Austin who got a phone call and said, hey, you want to be on a TV show? Um, are there other people like that that are doing novel work that maybe don't get a lot of mainstream attention or attention um, outside of academia? Can I just, yeah, just I got to say that one of the cool things is the number of women. I got, I heart. If I'm on YouTube, I'm listening mostly to women artists doing electronic music. Katerina Barbareri, uh, just in incredibly interesting music. Um, Caitlin Oro Smith, an uh, American artist. That's about all the names I can pull out of. But I mean, what's going on now is like really interesting. I have to say, you know, it's like. A bunch of old guys that want to drag out craft work or tangerine drink. It's like really not that interesting. But what the young people are doing is really, really cool. I just want to quiet now. Anybody else go and has anybody here listened to any you know, Caitlin or Elio Smith? No? You need to. Start with the album Ears and, uh, and take a listen to that. It's incredible. Um, just to just to go further with with the the answer to that question, um, in in Toronto, uh, I'm one of three people who organize a festival called the Toronto Sound Festival, and uh, one of our goals is to bring interesting new electronic music um, that is performed live uh, to to the audience in Toronto. Um, but at the same time, we're holding seminars during the day so that people can learn how to make music, or if they're already making music, learning how to make the music better, or produce the music better, mix and master the music better. Um, we, uh, we brought Heinbach in from Germany uh, this year uh, to perform. He's an experimental, uh, you could call it experimental ambient. He does his share of techno. He's begun over the last year working with the same gear that these guys were working with when they started out in the electronic music lab at U of T, all the, all the old analog test equipment. Um, and he's released a number of tracks in an album uh, made with that kind of equipment, and it's quite compelling. Um, so yeah, we have, we have people who are looking to uh, put this kind of music out in spaces for people to hear in hopefully uh, different ways. Um, we have, we have uh, goals about how we want to uh, 
produce the concert portion of the festival. Um, it really is sad that Mugfest is, is not around uh, anymore. I went in 2016, it was amazing. Um, but yeah, there are, there are things happening. I think what's happening though is that a lot of it is very local. So in, in Pittsburgh, you know, you've probably never heard of the Toronto Sound Festival. Um, and there's a lot of stuff probably going on in Pittsburgh that we don't hear about in Toronto. Um, so I, th I think there, there seems to be a, a whole movement where music is uh, at least um, more experimental, more new music, um, is, is very local. Uh, and I think that's kind of cool because as you travel around and you seek out the local scene wherever you happen to be, you're hearing different things and it's all amazing. I hope that helps with the question. Let's take one more question. Fine. Thank you for a very compelling conversation. I was curious about the nature of improvisation in electronic music, and particularly in your ensemble. Is there something fundamentally different about doing improvisational music when it's mediated by particular kinds of technology? I'll start with a simple answer. Is uh, when, when we're improvising together, uh, sometimes it's not clear who's doing what. So it's just purely what you're hearing, not knowing who it is. Sometimes you know, but that's my experience. Um, and then when you're looking at a live, like my first uh, time I went to a CEE concert before I had joined the band, what really amazed me was the visual uh, how, how they looked in terms of their stage presence, they basically, the music was just emerging and they were just like, these motions were independent because most instruments, you know, their gestures are like, you know, aligned with what you're hearing and here was, you know, a players like turning these knobs, so that's one answer anyway, that's the story. This is an example yesterday. Uh, we were sort of alternating between playing and uh, and uh, showing people stuff, and we're playing. And I don't think this happens if you play violin or clarinet or whatever, where you're going like this and so. I don't know why this and so. Why is it like this and You know. And fuck! I never switch that switch. All oh, right, I was showing someone what this switch did. Boom! Sound. <laughs> That isn't a problem that I think traditional instrumentalists ever experience. <laughs> and I, I'm probably the, the one person in the group who comes from more of a jazz background and, and jazz improvisation. And for me, it's very different. Um, in, in jazz, in rock, in progressive rock, you have a lot of boundaries. And what's really, what makes a solo or an improvisation interesting in that medium is the creative ways in which you break those boundaries, go outside of them, and then come back into them. We don't have those boundaries. So for me, anyway, it is a very different experience improvising with electronic uh, instruments um, versus, say, with a trumpet. You know, if, if you're a composer writing an orchestral score and you're sitting there looking at the page, all these instruments, all these different sounds, all these different possibilities, um, you know, it's really hard work. You, one note at a time, you compose. And uh, someday, you know, months, years later, you get to, you get to hear it. These instruments that we work with are really like more orchestral in terms of the richness of the of the, the timbres and the textures and the and the complex voices that we can program to have you know many things happening within one voice so it's really much more like having an instant orchestra um, and it's like um, just a, you know the touch of a finger to invoke kind of a, a parallel sort of degree of complexity and and, and sonic richness. So I think in that respect, it's very different from, from improvised jazz or, or other types of 
you know, one note at a time kind of improvisation. Um, we're gonna we're gonna shift to a more um, informal mode of discussion where you all can be mixing together and chatting over dumplings. Uh, but let's start by thanking uh, the members of the CDE. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And of course, I have to thank everybody here in the studio for Creative Inquiry, especially Paula, Tom, uh, Bill, Linda, so helpful. Um, and and thank you also to the to the CE from me for being so gracious and generous with yourselves this entire week. So let's chat, eat some dumplings, and uh, talk electronic music, okay? <laughs> <laughs>